pipelines once acted as something of a barometer for Canada-U.S. energy relations and security. Lately, some big developments. President Joe Biden canceled the Keystone XL pipeline. Also, a growing chorus in Michigan has raised real uncertainty around Enbridge's Line 5 pipeline, which supplies the majority of Ontario's crude oil. With us to examine the economic and political implications of those developments, we welcome, in Edmonton, Alberta, Andrew Leach, energy and environmental economist at the University of Alberta. In Calgary, Alberta, Kristen van de Biesenbos, associate professor of energy law in the University of Calgary's Faculty of Law. In Kingston, Ontario, Warren Maybe, Canada Research Chair in Renewable Energy Development and Implementation at Queen's University. And in the Davenport neighborhood of Ontario's capital city, there's Keith Stewart. He's a senior energy strategist with Greenpeace Canada, and we're delighted to have you for on our program this evening. I think we should just start by setting the table. Kristen, why don't you go first? How would you describe the role that pipelines play in Canada's energy economy, both today and for the foreseeable future? Well, thanks, Steve. Um, so as many of you probably are aware, Canada's major export markets are the United States and abroad. And in order to move most uh, Canadian crude out of Western Canada, and in particular the oil sands here in Alberta, we do have to send it via rail or by pipeline. Uh, pipeline is certainly faster and arguably safer. Uh, so that is how we get most of our product currently to the United States. And also, as we talk about line five later in the program, I believe, it's also how we move most product to Eastern Canada from Western Canada as well. So both now and in the future, pipelines are important for moving Western Canadian crude to ultimate consumption markets. And it's also the lack of pipeline capacity is also one of the reasons why prices for Western Canadian crude are a bit higher than they are for other types of crude. Andrew, what would you add to that? I think that just the, the relationship to development, that when you're talking about something like an oil sands project, it's a long run bet on having a market for your crude oil. So it's a 20 or 30 year bet and transportation is not going to be the lion's share of, of the financial implications of that bet. But if it's a five to $10 a barrel difference in what you get out of the product that you produce, that's gonna be material to your development decision. So there's almost a chicken and egg problem. Pipelines to some degree enable development, but you don't wanna build pipelines if you're not expecting the projects to come to fill them. Sure. Warren, if I'm hearing right, I'm inferring that pipelines are still pretty hugely important to the country. What do you say? I think that they are important. <clears throat> Certainly, we rely heavily on the oil and gas sector for a big part of our GDP. Uh, there are many, many jobs that are associated with these projects in Alberta and other parts of the country. And as we talk about Line 5, we also rely heavily on the oil that's passing through them to fuel the economy in provinces like Ontario and Quebec. Keith, what's your view? So when we're looking into the future, I think the era of pipeline expansion, of oil sands expansion, of uh, basically oil and gas expansion is over. I think we're looking at moving rapidly towards peak demand. And so what we would say is any new investments in energy systems need to be in that 100% renewable clean energy economy that's going to provide the jobs of the future. And so, so much of our economy is built around, oh, we need to expand the oil and gas sector. We need to build those new pipelines to get more product to market. That's something we have to realize is no longer in the cards. And we need to look at, okay, what are the jobs of the future? It's not actually in building new pipelines. It's in fairly dealing with workers as we transition out of oil and gas into renewables. Warren, do you agree with that? Well, I certainly think that there's a transition happening, and you can see it in the decisions that have been made uh, recently by companies like GM uh, that are announcing a move to all electric vehicles within the next 15 years. I mean, that's an incredibly short timeline and a massive change in the way that we're going to move around. Uh, and we're seeing it in the decisions that are being taken around new pipeline projects. I mean, uh, we've seen Keystone XL recently canceled by uh, the president. Uh, we've seen uh, the discussion around Line 5 emerge. Uh, and there are other pipeline projects that I think we'll probably hear about in coming years. Well, since you mentioned Keystone, let me pick up on that because, in fact, Joe Biden, who's only been president for about a month, uh, one of his very first orders of business was to cancel Keystone XL. And there was, of course, some pretty furious reaction about that. Here's what Chris Bloomer, who was the president and CEO of the Canadian Energy Pipeline Association, had to say about the president's decision. He said... This revocation of the presidential permit for Keystone XL is a backward-looking decision 
that ignores the tremendous progress made by the transmission pipeline industry over the last decade. Our energy is safely transported on some of the world's most technologically sophisticated pipeline infrastructure. Canada's transmission pipeline companies will continue to play an important role in the energy future for Canada and the world for decades to come. Now, just before getting you folks to comment on that, I guess I should say Mr. Bloomer uh, had agreed to join us on this program for this discussion. And then, Keith, he found out that you were going to be on the show, and he bailed on us. And, um, well, what do I say here? Andrew, Kristen, Warren, uh, I'm delighted you're not as petrified to appear with Keith as clearly <laughs> Mr. Bloomer was. Let's put all that to the side and say, regardless of that, what do you think... Kristen, why don't you go first on this? What do you think about his prognostication that pipelines are still going to be with us for decades to come? Well, we certainly have quite a lot of existing pipeline infrastructure that will probably remain in place for decades. Um, and I do think it's important to understand that the legal position of the permit for Keystone XL being issued via executive order the way that it was made the permit for Keystone XL very unique. Other pipeline permits are not issued that way. So I would be hesitant to try to draw too many conclusions from the way that Keystone XL was canceled because other pipeline permits are not as vulnerable um, to you know, the, the decisions of a succeeding president as this particular pipeline permit was. So, Andrew, we should not draw too much from the Keystone example? No, and that op-ed was really interesting, uh, Chris Bloomer's op-ed, because he talked earlier in that same op-ed about having uh, the pipeline being designed as a net zero emissions pipeline, which uh, that never appeared in any regulatory document until about the, the day after Joe Biden was elected. So I think it, it was, number one, a pipeline that was always symbolic. Number two, it was a pipeline that had initially had its permit rejected by President Obama. So it wasn't the case of, as, as Kristen said, it wasn't a pipeline that had navigated the regulatory process, been given a permit, and then been revoked. It was a pipeline that's been fraught from day one with effectively two vetoes from President Obama, then a very weird awarding of the permit initially by President Trump, and then a subsequent having to redesign it, and now it being revoked by, by President Joe Biden. I don't think it's representative of anything. Keith, let me get your take on if a pipeline could be built that was net zero, would you be in favor of it? <clears throat> So I, I also was amazed that that magically appeared the day before it was canceled in their their press announcements. Uh, saying you have a net zero pipeline, the, the pipeline is designed to carry oil. That's what it does. The pipeline itself doesn't emit a large amount of greenhouse gas emissions. You need the pumps to buy it. So it's basically like saying, okay, you know, if a tobacco factory said our workers aren't allowed to smoke on site, so our product doesn't cause cancer. It's the end use of the product that is a major problem on climate change. And the key thing about pipelines, the reasons they've been so controversial is because building new pipelines is about expanding the infrastructure that, as was said earlier, is going to be around for 30, 40 years. And once it's built, people want to use it. And so you need to make the decision early on, where are you going to put your investment dollars? And so I think Keystone, it had this sort of outsized importance. It has, if you would have told me in 2009, I'd still be talking about Keystone XL pipeline in 2021, I would tell you you were crazy. Um, but it's just, it's taken on this, it's important in and of itself, but also symbolic of the broader sort of where are we headed with our energy and structure as a society? Are we going to take seriously the challenge of climate change and make that rapid transition to renewables, to electric vehicles, to better public transit? Or are we going to continue to sort of double down on oil and gas? And I think it's a politically very fraught question and it's going to be, continue to be a conflict for a while, but it's here, I think that the, Biden came in and said, OK, we're, we're headed in this way. That's the signal we're sending. It's clear. It's unambiguous. Deal with it. And this is why you see Ford, you know, who actually backed, oh, gee, I'm sorry, who backed um, Trump on emission standards for vehicles, flipped and sort of said, OK, we're going to go electric vehicles. Hmm. Uh, well, that may have had something to do with wanting to keep jobs in Ontario and the auto industry. But be that as it may, let's clearly and unambiguously move forward here and talk about line five, which you've all referenced already. And I'm going to get our director, Sheldon Osmond, if he would, to bring up a map so those of you who don't know where Line 5 is, and for those of you who are watching on television, you can see it. If you are listening on podcast, I'll just describe it. It starts Enbridge Line 5 at Superior in Wisconsin and then moves east, crossing into Michigan. And there it travels across the Straits of Mackinac, where Lake Michigan meets Lake Huron, and then coming down south and east to the southern tip of Lake Huron, where Sarnia is, where it does its thing. 
Now, Kristen, why don't you fill us in on what the latest goings on around Line 5 are as we speak? So one of the things uh, to understand about Line 5 is that because Line 5 begins in Wisconsin and ends in Canada, most of Line 5 is actually permitted through state permitting processes. Unlike Canada, which if we have an interprovincial pipeline, like say Trans Mountain, you have the, the Canada Energy Regulator, the CER does the permitting for the entire line. That's not how it works in the US. So in the US, you only have a federal permit issued every time a pipeline crosses a federal work like the international border or um, something like a highway or federal waters. Other than that, all of the permitting is handled by the states. So the state of Michigan had issued years ago, Line 5 has actually been there since the 50s, the 1950s. So many, many years ago, Michigan issued a permit for Line 5. Now in 2018, the twin sections, most of Line 5 is a single pipeline, but it splits into two twin sections where, it, where it goes under the Straits of Mackinac. Um, in 2018, a tugboat anchor struck one of the twin pipelines under Lake Mackinac, I'm sorry, the Straits of Mackinac, uh, and there was a concern about the potential for a spill. That potential didn't actually occur. It seems like the anchor strike actually didn't damage one of the twin sections of the pipeline very much, but that sort of fed into concerns that had already existed about the possibility of a rupture or leak in the twin sections under the Straits of Mackinac and what would happen if you had an oil leak in those straits where they could potentially, where the oil could potentially flow into Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. And so the state of Michigan has a very strong conservation attitude towards the Great Lakes. And for quite a while, uh, since probably the early aughts, there have been concerns intermittently raised about the possibility of a spill from Line 5. But after 2018, those concerns became much more heightened. In 2019, the state of Michigan moved to try to remove the sections of the pipeline that go under the Straits of Mackinac. And just this last year in 2020, Michigan Governor Whitmer actually moved to withdraw the easement, so the right of way that allows the pipeline to go under the Straits. Um, if that were to occur, if those twin sections were actually removed, there have been plans that Enbridge has been pursuing to ultimately replace the sections of the pipeline under the Straits of Mackinac. Uh, but if the twin sections were removed in the near term, Enbridge has said publicly that it probably would not go ahead with its replacement plan. So that would essentially potentially end uh, the use of Line 5, which does deliver a large amount, uh, over half of the total crude oil to Ontario. And I think almost two thirds of the crude oil that's consumed in Quebec comes from Line 5. So if it were actually going to be halted by the state of Michigan, that would actually have a serious impact on Eastern Canada. Okay, that's a great summation and background, everything we need to know about the Line 5 situation. In which case, Andrew, talk to us about the implications of what Enbridge's possible decision on this could be. Well, as it happens, your, your producer was giving me grief for looking down at my desk, which happened to have the uh, 1959 Borden Commission on Canadian Energy Report uh, sitting on it, which, they, which gives you a sense of how long we've been talking about these questions of Western Canadian oil and its role in Eastern Canadian markets. And that disconnection of if, if we started to see the uh, disruption and, and a near term, very rapid disruption of crude supply into Eastern Ontario uh, and and uh, as far as Montreal via Line 9, sorry, Western Southern Ontario and as far as Montreal via Line 9, then that puts this uh, pipeline question into people's living rooms in a very different way, I think, than it has thus far. Right now, it's been remote. It's been about export revenues, as, as Kristen said. The, uh, it hasn't really been about the cost of fuel. And as much as politicians have tried to make it about the cost of fuel or the availability of fuel or energy security today, that's not the case. And, and you know, there are ways around something like a Line 5 disruption. But if it were to happen very quickly as a, a legal order to, to shut it down would, then you are going to have some, some solutions that take time to adjust to. And that's going to disrupt not only the ability to process crude in, in Sarnia, but also potentially how much gasoline you've got in, in eastern Canada until supply chains can adjust. Warren, do we have any reason to believe that this line is not safe as currently constituted? Not really. I mean, it's an old line and there can be problems with an old line. Uh, it is a line that is extensively tested and extensively monitored. Uh, there is a plan, and, and we've talked about it a little bit, to actually move part of the line into a tunnel under the Straits of Mackinac so that it wouldn't be uh, as susceptible to things like anchor strikes. Uh, so it's not exactly, you know, a, a 
impending environmental disaster uh, the way that I think it's been painted. At the same time, it's there's risky parts to it. You know, the Strait of Mackinac is a risky uh, sort of a crossing, and and moving the line underground into a tunnel, which is the plan, would make a lot more sense. Uh, there's a long-term question. You know, how long do we want this pipeline to run? It's almost 70 years old now. Do we really want to be looking at another 30 years? Well, let me ask Keith that. What would you do with it, Keith? So we obviously are saying, you know, we need to phase out uh, fossil fuels. We need a plan for that. So part of it, rather than sort of going pipeline by pipeline, it would be great if we were actually talking about how do we manage this transition. I think it's important to recognize that the opposition in Michigan has been, and actually to much of the pipelines in the U.S., has been led by Indigenous peoples who've been raising these concerns for a very long time. I mean, you can find tribal resolutions going back many years uh, expressing concerns about this particular line. It is 70 years old. Um, and it's also important to remember that uh, Ambridge's name is mud, name is mud in, in Michigan. Um, the third largest oil spill in the terrestrial U.S. occurred in Michigan from an Enbridge pipeline. It's uh, carrying bitumen. It caused massive damage. There was more, a billion dollar, more than a billion dollars to clean it up. The cleanup was never, you know, you can't really clean up some of that. The Straits of Mackinac, because of the way sort of the water moves and the sort of the, the pressures is a very risky place to have that pipeline. So this is really a question of, you know, this, this has been known as to be a problem for a long time. Enbridge has had decades to deal with this. And so there's a certain amount of brinkmanship happening here. It's kind of a shame we don't have someone from the Energy Pipelines Association because there are, you know, as Andrew said, you know, there, there are some workarounds in terms of how you'd have to reroute particularly. You can, there's sort of other pipelines to get oil to Quebec. But we really, I mean, it really, I think, points to the need for a comprehensive plan to move forward on how are we going to get off of fossil fuels? How are we going to wind this down as we wind up renewables? And I actually think, you know, yesterday, Biden and Trudeau were meeting. Part of the agreement they've come to is going to be around sort of joint work on climate change and hopefully a just transition plan, a sort of plan that sort of protects, deals with, fairly with workers, communities currently dependent on fossil fuels. Um, as we create those jobs in the new economy. And so, so line five is kind of a flashpoint right now, but it's part indicative, indicative of a much broader problem that we need to deal with as a system and not in these one-offs. Well, okay, Kristen, humor me on uh, yet another question on one-offs here, because I do want to talk just a little bit more about line five and the, I mean, I gather there's a lot of work for Enbridge lawyers here, right? What it, can you give us some of the flavor of what their legal case is here? Sure, there's a few uh, arguments that Enbridge is advancing. Uh, one of them is that even though it's true that the federal government in the United States doesn't uh, have comprehensive siting authority over oil pipelines, it does have comprehensive authority over safety. Um, there is a federal agency that oversees the safety of interstate oil pipelines. And so one of Enbridge's arguments is that because Michigan's position on removing the pipeline under the Straits of Mackinac is based on environmental concerns that those kinds of safety concerns can only be addressed by the federal government. And so if that's the reason why Michigan wants to re remove the line, that's actually, that concern is sort of preempted or what we would call uh, paramountcy, but it's called preemption in the states, that that kind of concern can only be addressed by the federal government. Um, and the other argument they're making, there's actually a treaty. It was entered into in 1977 between the U.S. and Canada after the oil embargo, uh, the Pipeline Transit Treaty, which essentially says that no state authority can interrupt permanently uh, flow of hydrocarbons between um, our two countries. So there is an argument also to be made that by the terms of the treaty itself, the state of Michigan is not able to cause permanent interruption to line five. It could potentially under the terms of the treaty, put it uh, essentially put the pipeline on pause while safety concerns were addressed. But if the if what the state is really trying to do is to stop line five altogether and remove the section permanently from the Straits of Mackinac, the, the terms of the treaty might prevent that from happening, or at least that's the argument that Enbridge will make. Hmm. I want to, uh, let me get Warren in here to talk uh, about the overarching history question here, and that is, you know, going back several decades, the ability for Canada and the U.S. to sort of come together and agree on how and where to build pipelines was a reflection of how close our two countries were once upon a time. Uh, we haven't come to a lot of agreements on this kind of stuff lately. What do you think that says? So, Steve, I think this is a great question, and I think it, it really cuts to the heart of part of the issue here. There was a time when the U.S. desperately needed Canadian oil. It was an essential part 
of the American energy picture. America still needs our oil, but they don't need it to the same extent. They've become much more energy independent over the last decade and a half. Uh, the you know explosion of shale oil and shale gas simply means that they have a lot more of their own domestic resource. And that has given the president the latitude to be able to cancel things like Keystone XL. And I think it's also emboldened a lot of the discussion about what do we do about these pipelines? There's no longer that kind of imperative around energy security. And Canada needs to be aware of that as we go into negotiations. You know, when the prime minister met with the president on Tuesday, I hope that that's something that he's just considering and taking into account. Well, let's actually bring uh, Prime Minister Trudeau into this conversation figuratively here because he has, he has said some things which are very supportive of trying to do something about climate change. On the other hand, he has also said uh, some things about what countries with a lot of barrels in the ground would do with that natural resource. So let's just play this clip of him and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. As I said on the very first trip to the oil patch back in 2012, no country would find 173 billion barrels of oil in the ground and just leave them there. The resource will be developed our job is to ensure that this is done responsibly, safely, and sustainably. Now, Keith, that line got some applause in Houston, Texas, not surprisingly, I guess. Um, it sounds like the prime minister's sort of trying to be, well, you want to say have it both ways on this issue? What do you want to say? I mean, in normal times, with normal politics, trying to have it both ways is the way you win, coming down the middle, it's a very Canadian way. The challenge is on climate change, we face some pretty hard, hardline carbon budgets. There are consequences to inaction. There's three things we can do about climate change. We can you know, burn less fossil fuels to, so that we don't raise the temperature as much. We can try and adapt to changes we can't avoid, or we can suffer. And the less we choose to do about rapid transition off fossil fuels and adaptation, the more we're making a policy choice to just suffer. And there's no way you can take 173 billion barrels out of the ground and burn it, and we still have a safe climate. But more importantly, I think the way the world is moving is there is not going to be a market for that oil. And we need to deal with that, and we need to prepare Canadians. And frankly, the rest of the country is going to have to help out Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland as we go through this transition. Canada has a lot of experience on natural resources sort of coming and going and booms. And we need to do a lot better job this time than we did with, say, the cod or the forestry industries in BC, Ontario, Quebec. Um, because in this case, fossil fuels are going away within decades. They're not going to go away overnight, but we're talking an unprecedented change, move away from this energy source if we're going to have a stable climate for our kids. And doing that can actually create great, good new jobs, but they're going to be different jobs and we need to help people through that transition. Andrew, can I get you to follow up on that? Yeah, I think one of the issues with a lot of this is we're talking about large global systems and bringing it down to talk about individual projects, or we're talking about a large resource and bringing it down to talk about an individual projects. I mean, if you talk about Prime Minister Trudeau's number about 170 billion barrels, you know, there's nothing in his statement there even that said, we're going to dig every barrel out of the ground or pump every barrel out of the ground or what have you. He's saying rightly that there's no country in the world that's going to look at that resource and just turn tail and walk away. They're going to evaluate what it does for them and what the best strategy is to, to deal with that resource. And, you know, to put it in context, we could produce oil sands at the rate that we're producing them today for probably a couple hundred years before we produce that many barrels of oil. So that's not the policy discussion we're having, plus or minus 170 billion barrels or plus or minus 2 trillion barrels, as some people have done. It's, you know, plus it's it's variations around the current uh, the current rate and whether we're building a few new projects or no new projects, whether we're shutting down existing ones or, or running the existing ones to the end of their lifespan. I think that's the, the kind of area where the conversation needs to take place. And 
it, it's really hard to get that conversation to a level where we're meaningfully moving the dial on global emissions. And it's not to say we shouldn't act on climate change, it's just to say that the global energy system is massive and we're burning fossil fuels, at almost mind boggling amount of fossil fuels every day. So each individual thing necessarily looks small. That doesn't mean don't do anything about it, but it means that you, you know when you're looking at those individual decisions, you can't make one project or one resource decision or one country's policy the make or break thing for action on climate climate change. So what I would say, though, to, to Keith's point is, I think he's right about the transition, but I think it comes in a different way than the way he's framed it, which is it comes earlier for a province like Alberta, because the boom in Alberta wasn't one about producing oil and, and windfall royalty revenues. It was about producing oil sands projects. And the reason why the Alberta economy boomed, all that jobs and employment was not just the oil money getting spent, it was the projects getting built. And so it's almost that growth rate of production that was driving the boom in Alberta, not just the production itself. And so even if you know we can have an argument about how much oil the world's going to use in 2030 or not going to use, but what's important to our economy in a way and, and, and to Canada is that question of the rate of change of Canadian production. And I think that we can agree that the outlook there has changed dramatically. And so the bets people were making on new projects year after year after year, that's gone away no matter what. And it's gone away because of price, it's gone away because of climate, it's gone away because of lead times, and it's disrupting a whole set of people who actually don't necessarily live that close to where the oil is produced. Well, we just got a few minutes left here, and I want to get both Warren and Kristen on this next question, which is, this sounds like a massive, for the ages, national project ahead of us. We've got to wean ourselves off fossil fuels. We've got to embrace renewables more. We've got to do something big about climate change. And we've got to help people in Saskatchewan and Alberta and Newfoundland and Labrador to make sure that they aren't crushed as a result of this transition. Warren, how in heaven's name do we realistically do all that? Well, <clears throat> the answer is that there's a lot of parts here. You know, we need to have worker retraining. We need to be investing in the new renewable technologies. One thing that we haven't talked about is that, you know, oil is still a resource and you can use it for things other than fuel. And one of the things that I think Canada should be looking at is, can we be using that oil for other value added products? Things that aren't contributing to the GHGs, things that are more durable. Uh, plastics is obviously a big example. We obviously want to avoid microplastics and, and the problems avoided are there. Uh, there are a lot of things that we can do, but we have a lot of smart people in this country, and I think we can make this transition. We need to develop a vision for where we want to get to. Kristen, take the last word on this, if you would. I agree this is probably the great challenge of our times, the energy transition, and how we are going to get through this transition, being a country that has, um, for the past few decades, really made so much of our money off of oil and gas in particular. But one thing I would also say is that I think we're also going to see the federal government try to take more decisive and bold action on climate change. Uh, up until the Paris Agreement, you really didn't see the Canadian government mm -hmm. trying to do anything on this um, on the issue of climate change and really left it up to the provinces. And I think we are starting to see the federal government really testing the limits of its own jurisdiction and trying to do things that it's never tried to do before. And of course, we're seeing pushback from the provinces on that. But I don't think that we're going to see Ottawa back off. I think we're going to see them continue to try to take control over what they can take control of and try to win the buy-in of the provinces where they can. Uh, let me sneak in another 30 seconds here, if I can, actually, for Andrew, because I do want to point out the fact that even though he's in Western Canada right now, you're an Ontario guy originally, Andrew, right? Yeah, born in Ottawa. Okay, and you've been out there, what, 15 years or so? Yeah, 2006, so we moved in the peak of the boom. Okay, what? maybe just finish off by telling us what we in Central Canada don't get about this story that you now get much more appreciably, given that you live out there. Well, I think it's, it's a couple things. I think one is, remember when, you know, the manufacturing industry was in crisis in Southern Ontario, and it, it wasn't helpful for people to say, well, there are jobs for you in the oil sands. Uh, for some people, that was a great opportunity. For Eastern Canadians, that provided a lot of great opportunity, but it didn't necessarily change, move the dial for some of the communities. 
And so I think that the key thing to, for people to keep in mind is that, you know, this, the people aren't that different. And I think we had the McMurray fire that, that humanized uh, Alberta to a lot of people in the oil sands region to a lot of people. But remember that the people working in the oil sands, that's, you know, functionally really the same as, as the people who are working in factories in southwestern Ontario. And what they wanted was, you know, their opportunity, but also opportunities for their kids to have the lives that they had. And seeing some of that pulled away and hearing that, okay, well, maybe there'll be some giant government program that will replace it for them isn't necessarily going to be great solve in the wound. So I think, you know, have that that little bit of empathy. We've had a lot of communities across Canada that have struggled with similar things, and we haven't really seen government programs be able to completely smooth over whether it's cod or lumber or mining or manufacturing. And so also that little bit of realism that, you know, we can't sort of wink and nudge and say, don't worry, everything will be fine, because for some people it won't. Now that truly, truly, truly is the last word. Andrew Leach, University of Alberta, Kristen Van de Biesenbos, University of Calgary, Warren Maybe from Queen's University, Keith Stewart from Greenpeace Canada. It's been great having you four on TVO tonight for this discussion. Thanks so much. Thanks all. Thank, Thank you. you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.